we've got someone who's um, a special guest speaker to come in and talk to us. And I was trying to work out how I was going to introduce our special guest. And then you can always find Warwick Mansell to help you come up with an introduction. So Warwick Mansell on Twitter last night said, how on earth did PTE get the Secretary of State Justine Greening to come to their launch event? And what was really nice, I was able to reply saying, hi Warwick, we asked. <laughs> and she said yes, so without any further ado, thank you so much for coming, ladies and gentlemen, Justin Green. I was having a typical constituency day just before this, so I was down, um, I'm an MP in Putney and I was down at the Putney foreshore where we've got this massive great project called the, um, I'll stop when I get really boring, uh, where we've got this big project called the Thames Tidal, which is a massive great sewer pipe that's being built under the Thames uh, to clean it up. So it's going to get really nice and clean, but it means lots of work in my area and therefore we're doing lots of community engagement, including this, this morning. And, so there I was, um, talking about sewage, and now I'm down here. <laughs> I'm down here, and I did actually think I would nip in to, to listen to this behaviour thing that you were just doing, because it did seem that that could be quite relevant and helpful uh, to some of my colleagues. Um, so I, I've got a few tips that I will pass back. Thank you very much. Um, but it's fantastic to be able to you know, join you at this inaugural conference that you've got. I, I understand you're planning to do some in other parts of the country, which would be fantastic too. And it just feels to me like it's the right moment uh, for this organisation now to be coming together, building itself up, bringing together teachers and parents um, to really go for excellence in our schools and across our school system. And like, here we are in uh, Westminster Harris. And it's a school that I, I've been to um, to visit before, and this summer had absolutely fantastic results. Fantastic results for young people. Another group of its students heading off to university, um, which is a real tribute to, to the school. And I think what I would say, though, is what we managed to see delivered here was more than just some results that some students had after they and their teachers had put in a huge amount of hard work. Um, actually what we saw was an institution that helped people take their next big step in their lives successfully to be able to get to university and, and, and I've, I've said this a number of times, I was the first person in my family to go to university. My parents, I don't think they really, to be honest, knew what it was all about particularly we know what it was going to be like uh, and all of that but i think we did know that it would be transformational for the next stage of my life and and it was my school that enabled that and we're in you know one of many schools around the country uh, that are that are doing that but it's transformational because it's about social mobility because particularly in the case of this school as a great example it's helping a lot of young people who might never have thought that they would go to university, that it would be something for them, or even if they thought it was something for them, might have felt like a bit of a pipe dream that they couldn't really achieve. Um, the ability of amazing schools, and six forms in the case of this, to connect people up with not just a dream and a hope, but actually being able to achieve it, is absolutely uh, something that shifts life, lives onto a higher level than they, they otherwise would have been. And this school is, is not just doing a lot of lessons for the students who come into it every, every day. Actually, there are lots of lessons for the rest of us. One of, us is, one of them is setting high expectations and, and really saying that actually, you know what, we have to work on, a, on an assumption, but it's a correct one, that talent is spread evenly throughout our country. You know, there isn't one group of young people that's particularly got it, and therefore we should expect them to be getting the good results. Actually, everyone's got talent. It's all over our country, and the reason what uh, we're involved in is so important is because great schools everywhere is how, in the end, we unlock that talent. So the Westminster Harris model um, is teaching us that. It's teaching us, though, also that strong schools are generally and often and, and almost always about partnership. 
fundamentally Westminster Harris was about a partnership between Westminster School and the Harris Academy but it's about so much more than that isn't it it's about a partnership between the school and parents between the school and the broader community that it's part of and, and it's a lot stronger for all of that and the children who come here actually come from all over London around a third of them are eligible uh, for free school meals and, and they get off the bus every day and they'll come in here to study all sorts of things, you know, whether it's classics, further maths, even politics, possibly. I'm not sure whether that's a good idea or not, actually. Um, and I actually met one of the children here uh, a couple of weeks ago. We were doing a conference with independence, with the Independent Schools Council. It was all about this partnership um, that we are really trying to build up between um, the state sector and the independent school sector. And, and there was a, a, a teenager there, Isabel, who had done, was at this school, but was actually um, doing her A-level drama in partnership with Westminster School. And, and she was talking about just what a big difference it had made having the two schools um, connected up. So this is a great school, I think, that teaches as many more lessons um, that we can spread through the rest of the school system. But in a way, it comes back to what you were just talking about um, in behaviour, which is, it's about culture, isn't it? The kind of culture that makes um, a school really successful. And when you get that culture right, um, it doesn't just permeate maybe through what you're able to achieve in terms of behaviour. And the culture, if you like, being part of that behaviour approach that any school's got. Um, but actually, we know that it leads on to better results. We know that actually it leads on to schools that feel like better places to work uh, for teachers as well. We know that for parents, it feels like there's a mission, a sense of purpose that they too can really buy into, that they understand and that they can get behind. And, and when you give people that, they can start to ask themselves questions anyway, saying, well, what might I do more to try and help my school with my child achieve that mission, that sense of purpose? And, and so I think what you're trying to do here is start to knit together groups of people that can really help drive and strengthen uh, the, those school cultures that make such a difference. Um, and I was at a school on Monday, a special school, a new school, probably one of the fastest schools I think the DFP has ever built. Because we managed to do it in literally weeks. And it was Kensington Aldred Academy. And this is the school that was right in the shadow of Grenfell Tower. And of course, I went over to that school actually the day after that dreadful fire to talk with David Benson, who's the principal there, about what we were going to do given that children couldn't be in that school. And we made ourselves a promise there, because he was running a great school with a great ethos that was really building up as each cohort of children had come in. And he was really un understandably concerned about how he kept that momentum going with his school, what it meant for GCSEs and A-levels, which were really um, just coming down the, the tracks for, for the students. And we, we, we made a decision there that that ethos of the school was what we were going to really use to carry us through. And we stuck to that. And we got them quickly arranged, uh, literally within you know, a couple of days almost, um, to be on a, a different site. And, and of course that took partnership of the Burlington Danes Academy um, and Latimer, who enabled the sixth form. But over the summer, we just had the most amazing team work on getting a new school built on the Burlington Danes site. But it was an ethos and a sense of mission that enabled everyone to get there. And we knew when we started that there were probably a million reasons why it would be really hard to deliver this project on time. But it was the culture that we had at the beginning, a sense of drive, a sense of purpose, and a sense of getting over problems and running towards them to fix them that helped us as a team. And that, I think, is effectively what you're trying to um, inject into our education system with the sort of work that you're all involved in. And from my perspective, um, some of our best academies, the best mats, are absolutely built around that sense of having a strong ethos at its heart. You can see what the ethos is here at the 
right when you walk through the door. They're often successful because it's, it's, it's an approach that really works, not just for any community, but for that community. So if you look at some of the work that's being done by Luke Dixon's uh, Trinity Academy, uh, Luke's Trin Trinity Academy um, in Bradford, Ed's Reach Academy in Felton, these are all schools that really work for where they are. They're not just on average going to be good. They're good for exactly where they're located and for those families and young, young people. I think they're also smart schools that are building an evidence base. And, and on all of this, actually, it's sometimes hard to get the facts, the nuts and bolts. How do you measure how having a strong culture, strong behavior, as you were talking about before, how that percolates into results? You've got quite a lot of good evidence, but actually there's so much more, I think, over time that we can build up in terms of what works, how it works, and then specifically perhaps the process that schools go through to put this in place because every school starts somewhere. We might know where we want to get to, but that journey and approaching it in the right way, understanding how to get through the pitfalls, understanding how to recover from setbacks, that, as much as anything else, is something that we need to, I think, get a, a lot better database and experiential base around, if I can get uh, techie for a, sec a, sec um, a second. The, the final few things I really wanted to talk about was, as ever for me, uh, the teaching profession. Somebody here, when I was, I was in the last session, talked about how in the end it is about great teachers and great leadership, and it is. You know, it's always... Great teams, it's always about great people and people feeling inspired and aiming for something. Um, I, went, I didn't plan to go into politics at all. I had a great career in industry that I really liked. I did it, though, because I realised over the years that it's people who change things and people make things different. Things just don't metamorphose into a different state on their own. It's generally somebody somewhere who makes the decision that they want things to be different. And that's why, for me, the work that we're doing in the department on the teaching <coughs> profession, strengthening QTS, looking at how we can make sure there's strong CPD that's consistent, that's high quality, and I know all the challenges around doing that in terms of workload and finding the space in a day, but it is vital. Because in the end, the thing that's really going to lift our schools are the leaders and the teachers in those schools. And the more, I think, we can work to lift them up, the more they will lift our whole education system around them. And it's why the Charter College of Teaching, although Mason, I think, for the longer term, is a really important piece of this jigsaw too. So there's a lot, a lot to do. I recognise that the other part of this that I finally wanted to talk about is parents, because I think the thing that's really interesting about this organisation is, is the very natural and definitive link into communities and into parents. Um, it's very clear to me coming into this job, um, and indeed having been a school governor myself for, for I think around 14 or so years, that the more parents are involved in schools, the better. Um, if, I think it's when parents get disengaged from schools that schools start to have challenges and I think the the tireless work that parents put into supporting schools but especially as school governors is one of the best ways that we've seen parents um, being able to to get involved and not just in terms of their time and their energy but the skills that parents are bringing to our schools as well and I think this way that you are now structuring your organization to really enable a, almost a more strategic discussion about how that link between the schools and parents for excellence can really work at a more national level. I think that's something we haven't seen before, but I really welcome, because I'm all for what I would always call a race to the top, and I think for all of the challenges that we spend a lot of time quite rightly discussing, actually identifying best practice, understanding what is working, finding out how that can become the norm rather than something that some people do but everyone else finds hard. That focus is one really 
that often holds out the greatest prize for us. And I think what you're doing here gives us a chance to really start understanding how the very best partnerships between teachers and parents really work and how we can then start to scale up all of that knowledge and understanding. Finally, um, I just really wanted to, um, to say I'm full square behind your ethos on a, a rigorous, robust curriculum and how important that is. Um, this is a government that's really focused on strengthening the curriculum right the way through children's school years. And I think we're really starting to see the benefits of all of the efforts that have gone in uh, from teachers around the country, the country in terms of setting high expectations for our, our young people. Um, whether it's on phonics, where we've now got nearly 150,000 um, six-year-olds on track to becoming fluent readers in 2016. This is 150,000 more than we otherwise almost certainly would have done. Um, around what we're doing on EBAC, which I recognise has been a debate, but when you look at the, the research by the Sutton Trust, we know that actually it's the children from the most disadvantaged backgrounds who end up doing the GCSEs that close down their options, and we want to keep them open, not closed. That's making a difference too. And in terms of reforming the GCSEs, um, I was out in one of my local schools um, on results day and, and saw one of the teachers there who had been doing these new maths GCSEs. And she said to me it had been massively challenging as a teacher to, to adapt. And they'd set themselves a challenge. And they'd set the children a challenge in terms of how and what they needed to know to be able to, to continue to get a great grade. But they'd risen to it and met it. And the sense of pride that they took from those accomplishments as teachers and what they'd been able to see their, their students achieve because of the work that they'd done, I thought was absolutely fantastic to see. And they were completely buoyed up and on a high from seeing all of this work come to fruition. And that, for me, as part of what you were focused on, is absolutely critical. Um, because it, it, it is a vital part of what we focused on. And then finally, you know, I, I would also say that you know, great schools are much more about a sort of narrow um, academic focus. It is about um, a broader enrichment of, of a young person's life. I, I think when I first went into the DFB, I said it was about knowledge and skills, the right advice at the right time, and then great experiences. And so I think how schools then go beyond that, that rigorous, robust curriculum to making sure that all of those other things that our young people need to need to do whilst they're at school, that they all happen, um, including arts, drama, music, which is something that I am, I'm a big music person for this worth. Um, all of that matters hugely. I think the challenge is how we make sure that um, our great schools can get that right blend to see it all happen. And I know that Rachel's Inspiration Trust is doing quite a lot of work um, in this area, particularly around excellence in music. I, I was a, a kiddie wink that was lucky enough to get to do violin when I was at school. Um, only just, I should say, because um, I played recorder, which I really liked. But um, we then got to the year in our primary school when, when some children were going to be allowed to do flute or violin and I wasn't one of those children. And I wasn't massively upset about it. Um, but what I didn't realise was that I was next on the list. And so when one of the boys thought it just wasn't cool to play violin, I got to play violin. <laughs> and I loved it. I was actually so small, my first violin was a quarter size violin. Um, so it's a bit like a George Formby ukulele. But anyway, um, I loved it. And, and it really, again, it was another piece of my learning from school. You know, we didn't really do a huge amount of classical music, I would have said, at home. Um, my best friend, who I, I will be seeing tomorrow, Louise, we met at Saturday Morning Orchestra when I was seven. Um, you know, these are the things that, that young people take from school. And, and often these are the areas, actually, where... <laughs> children mi mix in different ways and often mix with children from, uh, from different schools as I did with my friend Rees and we did beat her school around us too. Um, so let me just finish though um, just by saying what a pleasure it's been uh, to join you all today. Um, you're setting off I think on a really important journey here 
And when we look at everything that we've achieved, particularly around maths and free schools, they've really played a, a wonderful role in helping to lift standards and results in this amazing city that we're in right now. But I think what I want to see is all of that energy and effort and potential now come with us on the next stage of our education journey, which is to see all of that happen everywhere in the rest of the country, um, in parts of the country like places where I grew up that maybe have not seen as many maths and, and academies, but we know, for example, that excellence in teaching is exactly uh, what we need to see happen. It's why we're doing opportunity areas, because it's not just about maths, not just about academies, it's about understanding how we can work with schools inside schools and outside schools in their communities. But in the end, when you sum it all down, it is about setting high standards for ourselves, actually, and then working at how we can make sure that we meet them. I know some of you here are already involved in our opportunity work around the country, and I wanted to say a big thank you. Uh, what I've tried to do there is, is set up a framework that doesn't really dictate everything we're going to do, but sets ourselves some priorities in these areas, and then holds out a hand to people there and around the country to say, if you want to get involved to help us go further and faster, and you have some skills and energy that you can bring to this community, then we're open for you to do that. And one of the first things that happened when we did our opportunity areas was actually people in the DfE who got in touch with the Opportunity Area team saying, well, I grew up in Norwich, so if you want me to do something there outside of my, my day job at the DfE, I'd, I'd love to. And that's what we want. We want that kind of ethos, dare I say, um, of people coming forward to really help shift the dial in these places where, where we, we feel we've got the furthest to go, we feel we can go the furthest, and we feel there's so much potential that can be unlocked if we're able to do that. That's why... For me, I always and will always say I've got the best job in government and, you know, we're all, I think, so privileged to be able to be in this area that we all work in of education because um, nothing changes without people changing it, but if they're not in a position to, if they're not empowered to, then, uh, then you don't get past first base. So I think to have the chance to build up a future generation to really be able to shape our country and take it in a direction and make it better, I don't think there could be a more important job that any of us could be involved in. So thank you very much for your efforts. Good luck. Good luck. And, uh, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you.